Go ahead. To get started with the questions. That's okay. I think tonight is a really good example of what we we're really trying to do with this class and offer access for undergraduate students to some of the people like Barry Schnorr, who is just up here as an internationally renowned expert in his field that you all don't necessarily come across. We also have other people just like that um, for you for the discussion tonight. Um, uh, over to my left, immediate left is Mary Skopech, she's a senior research scientist for the water monitoring assessment section of the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we're going to have, save her slides right now just to allow uh, more time for questions, but her slides will be available on the course website, so if you want to take a look. A lot of it is over, some overlap with what Jerry has just presented, but also you can, uh, take a look at that. Uh, last uh, year, she received the John Wesley Powell Award from the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Iowa Water Science Center for Research and Development and Estimating Stream, Stream Flow and Water Quality Values for any point on the stream. And so she obviously has expert in stream and water quality, a huge issue in Iowa. Um, to her left is Jean Parkin, and Jean is the Donald E. Bentley Professor of Engineering and Professor of Civil Environmental Engineering and Director of the Center for the Health Effects of Environmental Conditions at the University of Iowa, and she's a specialist in environmental biotechnology, in particular in bioremediation. And to his, his left is Nathan Young, who's an associate research engineer at the IIHR, which is the Iowa Hydro Center, um, and a senior researcher at the Iowa Flood Center. Obviously, very relevant to what we've been going on recently. So, with that, we'll go ahead and start taking your questions. I know you all have questions because you all brought them forward. So. There's a whole box of them. Yeah, yeah. there's a whole box of them right you there. Start handing them out randomly and you start being like, you, you don't remember what you asked? <laughs> well, yep. uh, my question is for uh, Jerry, oh, Mr. Shearer. No, Jerry is, uh, Jerry's fine. You mentioned that uh, in your slide how uh, precipitation uh, over the whole world is increasing. No, I, I said uh, wetter areas are getting wetter, but the global oh. rainfall rate, it, it, there's some indication that global rainfall rates are increasing. I was wondering if you could explain uh, what we could do to sort of uh, uh, remedy the whole uh, eutrophication in the Gulf Coast and uh, problems with hypoxia. Because it seems like we're taking steps, like you said, uh, to conserve like uh, no till and contour, uh, following things like that. I was wondering, uh, with steps like those, what else can we do? I, I, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and repeat, repeat the question. Okay. And that's, what are the, some of the remediation issues that we can do to help with Gulf hypoxia? Sure. Um, I think uh, everyone can help with that question, but uh, I, I'm sorry, I sort of ran out of time at the end, but I tried to show some things, including creating wetlands to hold back those nutrients in the, in the wetlands and uh, <clears throat> the riparian buffer strips and things like that to try to keep the nutrients from uh, going off into the streams and running down to the Gulf of Mexico. So that's certainly one thing we can do. I'd like to add to that. I think, you know, you were making the connection between rainfall and hypoxia um, you know, one thing that, especially talking about the state of Iowa, we have a leaky system. Our, our land doesn't really hold the water like it used to. We have a lot of runoff. Um, the landscape has changed. And so the hydrology, the way the water moves off the landscape is part of the problem. Our land doesn't hold the nutrients anymore. It, it leaches out into our river systems and is lost very easily. So anything we can do to retain that water or that rainfall on the landscape for a longer period of time will help to keep those nutrients on the land as opposed to in the water. So in cases of increasing precipitation, that challenge gets more and more challenging. Uh, we have less and less control over that rainfall. So we have to think about controlling the water in order to control all the other things that are a negative consequence like Gulf of Mexico hypoxia. The question has to do with not only the quantity, but the timing of water, particularly in the right. Uh, I know better the Midwest, but in our own in our own case, the timing is changing. There is pretty good evidence of that. So it's not only the amount, but the timing. The farmers have about a week with climate change in the last 50 years. They have a week longer uh, frost-free period, and uh, but the problem is they can't 
So now they can plan on May 1st instead of May 15th. But the problem is they can't get in the field on May 1st because it's always so darn wet. <laughs> it's probably going to be like that again uh, this year. And uh, with respect to the Sierra Nevada and the Rockies, I have read a little bit. And in general, they're, they are getting uh, the timing of the events are much more intense. So it's uh, more difficult to store the snowpack reservoir. I'm sorry, I have to add to that too, because I think that it's important if you think about what Jerry said in terms of those rainfall events coming in early spring, if you think about what our croplands look like in early spring, they, by the, you know, for the most part, are bare. Um, the crops aren't up yet, so a very intense rainstorm coming in March, April, and May has a, has a more devastating impact on the land, and the land is, again, less able to use that water for the crop growth. Um, early in the spring than later in the season. And so that shift in timing is a, is a big issue for us to try and deal with what that consequence on the landscape is in terms of soil erosion and again, loss of nutrients that are leaching early in the season. Question, there's a lot of bad news about all these things that are affecting Iowa. What's some good news? We have warmer winters. <laughs> That's amazing. In the last 30 years, we're, we're five to seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer winters. You wouldn't know it from this yeah, one right now. Sick. But uh, we and short and longer growing season, but other problems with the growing season. But uh, we have our data shows uh, less um, uh, bec these are all climate change issues, not land use issues. But uh, our data shows uh, much uh, less severe cold in the winter. So you don't have to heat your house as much. We almost never get a day below 15, below Fahrenheit anymore. Uh, and we, uh, surprisingly, we have many fewer hot days, which the climate models do not get correct. But we almost never get days over 100 any longer. I think it has to do with the air is moister, and it's more difficult to heat uh, moist air. So we don't have to cool as much in the summer. So those are all some good aspects of uh, climate change. It's just that darn flood <laughs> that you have to worry about. Well, and, and I think because it's a policy course, it's important for me, one of the things that I see in the Department of Natural Resources environment is the, the people have power. And if I go back even to the beginning of the Clean Water Act, I mean, the Clean Water Act has a huge amount of provision for public input. Um, you as a citizen have the right to comment on what our water quality standards are. You have the right to comment on how those standards are implemented in the state. You have a right to talk about water withdrawal and how we permit that. You have a right to have a say in that. And I think oftentimes people feel very disempowered, as though the government or people in charge are making these decisions and they have no say. There are, there are huge avenues for people to have a say. and. We've seen a big shift in the last 10 years with people pushing an anti-degradation law, for example, um, which is a requirement of the Clean Water Act. If you go back to 1972, we we're supposed to have this rule that says, we won't let our waters degrade any more than they were in 72. It's taken us, what, 30 some years to get that rule on the book, largely because of citizens threatening to sue the state, threatening to take legal action as citizens, which is allowed under the Clean Water Act. So I look at it in terms of, Yes, there's, there's a limited amount of good news perhaps in the data, um, but it all starts with the decisions that, that you all make in terms of either the public policy arena or your individual decisions um, and how you run your life. But I think it's really important for people to know that they are making a difference in, in changing. Jerry talked about the number of impaired waters we have. That's solely a result of, of, le of legislation that happened because of citizen threats of lawsuits. And the monitoring program that we have, that we didn't have in 1999, is because of citizen action. So that's where I see the silver lining, is people getting involved and not feeling as though they can't make a difference because it's too overwhelming for them. Mary, could you talk a little bit about what they did in the volunteer organization, did in the Clear Creek Basin? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, that's a really good that's example. A, that's a good story. <laughs> um, we good have monitoring. a volunteer monitoring program called iWater, and you're all invited to come become volunteer monitoring people. Um, and we had one individual who was very interested in um, Old Man's Creek and Clear Creek. And 
by getting out there and sampling that creek, at the very, very headwaters, we have what we nicely call an unsewer community, um, which is essentially a community <laughs> where the toilets are directly piped to drain tiles in the fields that are discharging to a creek. Um, many people would consider those sort of developing world issues and not Iowa issues, and yet it, it, it occurs in Iowa. And I've got a slide of 600 communities that exist in Iowa. But this volunteer went out there and found that that raw waste was ending up in the stream. And through his actions, um, mobilized an entire community to get sewered, to get something happening there, to, to remove the fecal matter from getting into the stream. And it was all done through the data collection. Without the monitoring, we, we really couldn't take action because we didn't know what was really occurring, the severity of it. Um, so again, about 4,000 volunteer monitoring folks out there, that that's one of many success stories that we have now of people changing their communities um, and working together to make, to make those changes. So again, you guys can make a difference if you, if you choose. Gene, what do you think are some of the bigger issues in Iowa? Well, I think Mary talked a little bit about um, the unsewered communities. One of the major problems I think that we're going to have in Iowa with all these smaller unsewered communities is meeting the newer water quality standards for nitrogen and phosphorus. There have been some estimates that it will cost upwards of a billion dollars in order to do this across the state. And that's a particular challenge for small communities. Of course, I'm only talking about areas that are within my expertise. So there's uh, a great need for developing sort of innovative uh, technologies that are relatively inexpensive and that, that can be implemented in small communities like these, these unsewered communities, I believe there's something like 700 of them um, that are in need of these kinds of things. And if we're going to uh, make a dramatic impact in improving the water quality in a lot of these, at least smaller streams, um, those kinds of actions are going to have to be taken. At least from my point of view, that's one of the more challenging aspects of water quality in Iowa. How about bypass flows? Do you want to talk about that? What about you? What do you, what do you see as Flood perspective or some other sure. So, uh, you know, my background is not in water quality, but rather in uh, river mechanics and how water flows in rivers. Um, and as part of the flood center, obviously, I, in my opinion, would be that uh, given the severity of the floods in 2008 and the increase in frequency and intensity of rainfall that um, Jerry mentioned in his presentation, uh, I, I feel flooding is one of the major uh, challenges we're going to be facing here in the next several years. Huh. Well, the one thing that I was going to mention um, to you all is, you know, on one hand, we're looking at the infrastructure issues, and I think Jerry nicely summarized, when you start putting numbers with a trillion on there, it gets kind of scary very rapidly. Um, and we're, we're facing this aging infrastructure that was meant to last maybe 30 or 40 years, so it's, it's sort of entering its twilight years. At the same time, we have all these non-point source pollution problems, and we don't have a lot of regulatory tools. That's all done through voluntary measures, paying farmers to do some, some things voluntarily. We don't have enough money in the world, I don't think, to, to fix all these problems all at the same time. And so we, we do have to think more innovatively. How can we use simple technologies to fix problems? How can we um, use something like a cover crop, which grows late in the season after harvest, carries through the winter into the spring? Um, you know, How can that reduce the losses of water um, in those intense rains that come in the spring. How can that hold our soil? How can it reduce nutrients? You know, those are some very innovative things that don't cost a lot of money because money is going to be in short supply. Um, so I look at it as we're being pinched by the infrastructure needs and the non-point sort of agricultural needs in the state. We have to find a way to sort of work together to, to fill those gaps. Reason, um, Good I mean, whoever from their area is wanting to talk to some of the jurisdictional problems because if one of the things that's peculiar to water policy in a setting like the United States is you have, you know, historically federal control of the watersheds. So it's one area where the federal government's involved, which is why, you know, among other things, the Army Corps of Engineers manages, you know, the dam and the watershed. But beyond that, if you, you know, if you think back to, to Jerry's sort of water cycle, you have this, like, jurisdictional maze of fragmented government where, you know, you have federal standards but no money to meet them. You have local governments that are dealing with the basic cycling of 
water and no communities you have the state, you know, Mary works for. I mean, so one of the problems is not just who's going to pay for it, but, you know, how it's going to be managed across this tank. So the question I have to do with all the jurisdictions that water across the state, local, federal. <laughs> we all get along perfectly. I don't know what he's talking about. Um, it, it is a huge issue, and, and part of it is um, it, it's not only within a state, the, the jurisdictional issues, but then cross states. And so when you start talking about something like the Mississippi River, where you have to get all the states on board and the federal agencies, um, it, it becomes a rather challenging thing. Um, and I'm going to toss some of this over to our engineering friends, but I think there's some, some ability to use sort of thoughts about regional um, facilities. You know, we have a city of Iowa City wastewater treatment plant and a city of Coralville wastewater treatment plant and a city of North Liberty wastewater treatment plant. And I don't know, maybe there could be some combination there, but they're not really set up to do that, I don't think, very effectively. Well, uh, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, when I teach environmental engineering design, we talk about wastewater treatment. When I was a graduate student, was about, I really don't want to admit how long ago that was, but around 1970, when these pieces of legislation were being passed. And the paradigm at that time was that we were going to hook up every person in the United States to a sewer. So no matter how far you lived away, we were going to hook you up to a sewer. And at that time, energy was cheap, and we thought centralization was the, was the solution to everything. And now we're finding out, for example, in these larger uh, cities, I lived in Philadelphia for about eight years, and they had some sewers in Philadelphia that were made out of brick and wood, and uh, they had been constructed sometime between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War, and they were still being, still being used. And so if you look in these really larger communities, the idea that we would go with this, what Scott Wallace, one of Jerry's former students, calls big pipe treatment, is really kind of unsustainable because how are we going to do that? So a lot of us are kind of looking at, instead of uh, coordinating all these things together, how do we decentralize them? I mean, we're doing that with power now. We're doing that with lots of things so that you give more local control. So that's a really kind of a, 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 an interesting uh, issue as to how that you might do that. Um, talking about the flood that happened in 2008, I believe you might have been at the meeting in Ames where they were talking about all the, the different kinds of agencies that had to be involved in management of water in a given watershed or e even in a local, uh, local area. And how these people all had to get together and start talking to each other. The DNR had to talk to the Army Corps of Engineers, had to talk to this group, had to talk to that group. And maybe that would be a better way to go at it rather than having the facilities themselves be kind of uh, centralized, which might be kind of difficult to do. Another uh, thing to think about relative to these centralized facilities is the way in which we get wastewater or water from a decentralized location to a, a centralized location is basically by throwing electricity at it. If you think at the lar of the large interceptor sewer that's going to connect the north treatment plant in Iowa City to the south treatment plant, I think the north plant's going to go out of commission here in, in two or three years or something like that. So we built a big interceptor sewer. Um, and the way in which engineers do that is they want to make gravity work all the time. So they have these sewers slope like this so that the water flows by gravity and you don't have to put a lot of energy into it. But if you go out to Napoleon Park, right where those softball fields are, you'll see a pump station because going to the wastewater treatment plant all the way three miles south of town near the Pleasant Valley Golf Course, you can't dig deep enough. It gets too expensive. You get down into the water table, so you have to lift the water back up. And that costs you money because you have these pumps and so you're spending electricity. Now, maybe with some of the new energy changes that take place with solar power and those kinds of things, maybe, maybe we can do that a little bit more. But I think the trend is going to be more toward decentralized systems rather than centralized systems. Well, and just to clarify, I wasn't speaking about the facilities being centralized so much as having coordination. Because, for example, in the case of North Liberty, their wastewater treatment plant became subsumed by the communities of Coralville and North Liberty. And so you end up with this facility sort of stranded in the middle of the of the community. Um, but I think coordination, for example, in terms of drinking water or wastewater, within communities that are right next to each other, if you can coordinate that, that might make some sense, whether or not the facilities are, are combined. But I agree, in terms of the hinterlands, you know, some of those um, innovative technologies that are more decentralized make a lot of sense, because there aren't, in the case of Conroy that was brought up before, they didn't have a lot of money or a lot of people. And so going with a very 
traditional big type lagoon didn't make a lot of sense from a money standpoint or an operational standpoint. So it's sort of maybe both in terms of where you have large cities crossing jurisdictional boundaries, talking to one another, and then mm -hmm. in the hinterlands, sort of more, you know, the definitely decentralized model. But it's it's tough to work across those boundaries because it's hard enough just to talk within the DNR, let alone trying to talk to other organizations. And I, I'm not sure how you get around that other than it seems like, you know, there, there's a number of coordination councils that have been formed in the state to try and break those boundaries. But sometimes that, that's successful. Um, I, can, I can talk about the Singapore example is those uh, tubes that I showed you, those are high pressure membranes. They require a lot of energy to force the water. It's like your kidney, you know, that requires a lot, awful lot of energy to force the water through uh, those membranes. And uh, the materials, the membranes themselves are very expensive also. And lastly, the brine, it's, uh, the reject stream from those is concentrated salt. And you have to uh, build a diffuser pipe. If you live like Singapore on the ocean, you have to build a diffuser pipe to get rid of that or deep six it into a groundwater, a deep uh, groundwater aquifer that's already really uh, hyper saline. So all those aspects are expensive. And that's why Singapore itself decided, no, reusing the wastewater was much, much cheaper than uh, trying to desalinate uh, brackish water or ocean water. However, they are now the expert in that technology, and now they are building desal plants for other people, as I mentioned. Uh, o ocean desalination. They have gotten a lot cheaper over the last 20 years or so. The membranes are uh, better. Um, they're more energy efficient, so the amount of energy that you need to produce a gallon of water, for example, has continued to go down. And that's because of technological developments in preventing the clogging of the membrane and how the membranes are clean and those kinds of things. So they are getting better, but they're, they, they may asymptote out and, and the improvement may not get much better. The question has to do with the, what's being done to keep the invasive species out of Iowa. Uh, there, there are a number of programs. There is an invasive species program in the Department of Natural Resources. In the case of something like zebra mussels, it's mostly done through public education. So. Um, where people take their boats out, there's signs and there's literature talking about what you can do to keep those zebra mussels. Um, I think there's a lot of fear that even with those signs and with that information that people still will transport zebra mussels around. Um, we're seeing Clear Lake, for example, has them now. Um, flying carp or the Asian carp, um, those things, you know, at this point there's nothing that we're able to really specifically do to keep them out. What's interesting is Jerry talked a little bit about taking out some of those low head dams that we have in the state. Um, there have been a lot of, there has been a lot of interest in taking out those low head dams, but then you have something like these Asian carp coming in and you think, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't take them out because they do provide a barrier to things moving upstream um, that you don't want to move upstream. So it's, it's sort of a catch 22 because you want to take them out to help some species, but you're also going to help those invasives as well. Um, and, and it really it comes back to public education, trying to work with people, um, trying to pull garlic mustard when you can, but it, it, it is a challenging thing to do because you <laughs> can't keep up with the weeds. It's hard to keep up with the zebra mussels. Um, you know, public education has only gotten us so far. Is there more that could be done if there were resources available? Sure. Mm. Jerry's issue. Always. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Always, if you have resources, you can do more. You know, the, the one. The, the, ones the uh, ballast waters, you know, that the, uh, the zebra mussel problem was, pre was predicted actually a couple of years in advance of when it showed up. Uh, that specific species, uh, there's an article that says it's going to happen if we don't. Uh, require ballast waters to be re in, uh, rejected out at sea and uh, chlorination and, and cleaning out of all the ballast tanks. So with resources, you could prevent a lot of this mixing of species that's going on, but we haven't, we haven't done it. <laughs> Abby, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a good one. Well, I, I think 
as way of background for people, if you look at the United States, there's sort of two types of water rights. Um, in the state of Iowa, we have water basically belongs to the people of Iowa. And so the state allocates that as a public good to whoever they think deserves it, needs it the most. And we have a criteria that goes through how we allocate that water. Um, but we have the right to, to decrease that allocation if we think that you know, um, an ethanol plant comes in, we allocated them water, but then we see negative impacts on, on other private wells. We can change that allocation. In the West, it's not quite so simple. It was the first in time, first in line. So whoever got there first and purchased that land has that water right. Um, and so it becomes sort of the East versus the West sort of model the way you do things. And um, one of the examples of trying to hold on to water in, in the East would be rain barrels. Um, rain barrels are illegal in many states in the West because you're not allowed to intercept the rainfall that even hits your ground if it has been allocated to someone else through the Western water rights. And so you end up with these very challenging policies and the federal government ends up getting involved potentially, um, but it's sort of had that big divide and I don't know if people are always aware of what happens in the West is much different than what happens in, in the East for the most part. Yes, I have a brother-in-law who lives in California. Um, actually, he and I went to school here together, and then we moved to California and married sisters, but that's a different story. But he's worked for the State Health Department in California since roughly 1973, and so every time he comes back here quite often, we go out there quite often, he will tell me stories about basically water, because that's what he's been in charge of, and how in uh, California the issue of water rights is a huge deal. For example, you'll have farmers who have the right to uh, mine the groundwater uh, beneath their land. And the water becomes so valu valuable that those farmers will sell that water to cities because the cities are water poor. I mean, if you think about it, the Colorado River, I don't think the Colorado River goes through California, does it? But, no, but they Southern it California water. has bought water from the Colorado mm -hmm. River and gets diverted there. Their water, the waters are diverted from Northern California to Southern California. So water rights out there are a huge deal. And um, if you really want to learn a little bit about it, uh, read the book Cadillac Desert. And if you ever seen the movie Chinatown, this classic movie, it's about water rights. And in California, they get close to going to war over water rights. It's a big deal. It's not such a big deal here. But yeah, it's, it's a good question, though. But the other thing to notice, too, is in terms of allocation in, in the East, a lot of times those allocations were based on when times were good. Um, I think the Southeast has suffered from that, Atlanta specifically. Some of those allocations in terms of water distribution were based when it's rainfall seemed to be a lot more plentiful. And so, as Jerry showed you, the changing precipitation patterns, if your allocation was based on something that no longer holds, how do you translate that forward into a new water regime? Um, so things that have become law or become the way that we handle water are not really prepared for climate change. And you know, that, that's something as a country we're going to have to struggle with in terms of how we reassess how the question has to do with the impact of the water and other impacts. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. 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 Well, generally, um, it, it part of the regulatory process, uh, FEMA and the, the DNR and others, um, we'll do some analyses to determine how much um, development can take place in the floodplain and how close it can be to the river before there becomes an impact. And they generally exclude development in that area. It's called the floodway. Um, so in areas where there have been uh, FEMA studies performed, um, they prevent development in, in that region. Um, out in areas where no FEMA studies have been performed, you know, it's kind of a free-for-all in many cases. What about the impacts, though? What are, what are the things that actually happen from building along the river? Uh, when you build along the river from a flooding perspective, um, there's a risk that you're going to limit the amount of water that can flow in the river or flew the river, through the river corridor, and it'll create a bottleneck and backwater up and flood places upstream. Um, and you guys can probably speak better to the water quality aspects, but. <coughs> Um, you're also losing some of the ecosystem services associated with flood attenuation. Um, so, you know, things like wetlands um, and, and other natural lands that are, are available to 
um, hold the water in, in place as the flood occurs and keep it from moving downstream and detaining it, um, prevent the, the, uh, the higher flows downstream that may impact other communities. <coughs> and then, again, water quality uh, is another story. The question has to do with looking for advocates for water quality issues and how to determine people's views on that. She knows but can't say. <laughs> I would say that the best way to know where someone stands on something is go to some of the legislative forums that exist. Um, there will be one, I think, coming up in Corville. Um, North it, Liberty. North Liberty. There's a, there's a legislative forum. Um, those are opportunities to ask your local legislators where they stand. Um, and sometimes I think it's just important to follow pieces of legislation. There was floodplain legislation that was introduced this last session. Um, that's a good opportunity to ask the, a senator or someone, you know, where do you stand on such and such a bill? And you know, again, emails or phone calls or letters, um, they will respond to a, a citizen who contacts them. I can't really say who's the best advocate, um, partly because that changes. And, and uh, everyone, no one's against clean water. Um, but sometimes where they take a stand on a different, you know, specific issue depends on what else is going on. So um, I would say take, out, take advantage of those opportunities where there are forums or, you know, their, their email and contact information is all over the web anymore. Contact them. Ask them. The question about the change in land in Iowa, One, two, three, the elimination of most of the prairie and stream, what kind of scale would we have to get back to be able to make a difference? That's a great Great question. Our flood center is working on it. Yeah. <laughs> so to my knowledge, I don't think any of that work has been performed. Um, as part of the flood center, we're developing um, basin scale and state scale models to investigate how the best management practices that Jerry described in his talk, uh, which also benefit flooding by retaining water, um, might impact uh, the state and, uh, and flood impacted communities. Um, so as part of that. Nate, has anyone just made the more simple calculation asked like uh, for the, the, this 10 or 12 inches of rain in the 2008 flood in the Cedar Valley, is there enough wetland volume to hold that much water? Have they even made that? That seems kind of like a straightforward yeah. calculation. Yeah, I don't know numbers, but I, I think people have done that sort of investigation and uh, all the conclusions are that the flood of 2008 was such an enormous event that nothing that we do on the landscape would have made, uh, it would have made an appreciable impact, but would not have prevented flooding. Would pre-settlement have staved off that flood? I don't believe so, no. It's the, by the time the, the large uh, intense rainfall events occurred, uh, the preceding events had saturated the water or the, the land and there was very little capacity to retain any water. So it just all ran right into the streams. I, I want to just touch on something that you said briefly in terms of crystal clear streams. I think there is a bit of a misconception that Iowa streams have always been muddy, have always had lots of nutrients. And there's a lot of evidence now through hindcast modeling as well as some additional data that, that goes way back 100 years now um, that shows that that wasn't the case. And so I think that it's important for people to realize that Iowa streams don't have to have lots of nutrients and a lot of sediment and a lot of bacteria. Um, that, again, if we go back to um, what, what the landscape might have looked like, we probably had average nitrate levels less than one milligram per liter. Now our averages are up seven or eight. Um, so there, again, I think it's important for people to understand where we came from. I don't know that we can get back to one, and it may take large, landscape changes, um, but it may not in terms of, um, you know, if we can put strategic wetlands, if we can do cover crops, if we can hold back the water, it's not going to be a single silver bullet solution. And I think we have to be looking at a multitude of options that will hold back that water nutrients. But people often think that we always had poor water quality, and, and that, that just isn't really the case in most of our streams, that we, we did have very high quality streams with abundant wildlife and, and fish life. So put that misconception to rest. You haven't seen it in your lifetime, but it did exist. There's a, one of Jerry's former PhD students, Lou Licht, who some of you might know. He, uh, he has a small company in North Liberty called Ecolotree. 
Lou is of the belief after the, the floods that happened in 2008, Lou believes in a, what he calls a 2% solution. He believes if we could define, and maybe Nate and his coworkers could find that, the critical 2% of the watershed area and uh, do something like uh, have uh, buffer strips or, or something like that that could intercept both sediment uh, nutrients and a little bit of water. It would not prevent the flood of 2008, but it could have uh, uh, at least attenuated the nutrient loads and the sediment loads that might have gotten to the streams. So uh, the critical part of that 2% solution would be to define the critical 2% in each of these watersheds. And that might be something that the flood center could help with. The frequency of floods versus the ability to get funding to be able to help with mitigation. When do banks quit loaning uh, yeah. Yeah. in a floodplain? <laughs> Just put on your no. banker's hat and yeah. answer that question. Well, the, in the state of Iowa currently, the 100-year floodplain, um, as defined by FEMA studies, is the regulatory floodplain. And any construction taking place uh, in the 100-year floodplain is subject to the regulations imposed by the DNR, which you may be able to speak more intelligently about than I can. Um, so that, that's how uh, development is limited, uh, in part by requiring uh, the developer to, or the, the property owner to purchase flood insurance, um, among various other regulations. And could you just real briefly define what a 100-year floodplain Okay, sure. Sure. So the 100 year floodplain uh, is the 1% uh, annual chance of, so any property within the 100 year floodplain has a 1% chance of being flooded in any given year. So um, it's not a cumulative probability, it's uh, every year you have a 1% chance of being flooded. Um, so you can't say, well, it's flooded uh, you know, five times out of the last six years, so I should be safe the following year. Um, you know, that, that's not correct. It's always a 1% chance every year. Is that? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, it's easy as physical scientists to look at things very dispassionately and say people shouldn't live here and they should do this and they should do that. Um, the one thing about, say, the flood of 2008, if you look at the number of people that lived in those areas that were significantly impacted. The income levels, the, the socioeconomic status was not the same as people that were maybe living outside of that area. And, you know, having had occasion to talk to um, Michael Richards, who was the Oakville Jackson Neighborhood Association president in Cedar Rapids, you know, one of the things that was really a challenge is the homes that they were being told that they should buy outside of the floodplain were two to three times the cost of the home that they had currently owned. And in addition, many of those folks were elderly, um, you know, so there were all these other factors besides just the rational, you shouldn't live in a, fl a floodplain. And I think it's important to not forget that there's a social science to some of this as well. Um, how do you move people out just compassionately right. and, and not move. make them take on an economic hardship that really is unreasonable or very difficult for them? Um, you know, breaking up neighborhoods that had a long history, say, in Cedar Rapids. So um, that was something that they were very concerned about, is that they just simply couldn't afford the homes that were being talked about outside of the floodplain. Um, and people were going in there and, and rebuilding their homes with their own bare hands, going to Lowe's and, and getting two by fours, because that's what they could afford. Um, so that, I just wanted to add that as so, something that's more challenging, because it's not just a simple, Here's the floodplain, you shouldn't live here. I think we all know that that's not a good place to live. It's just a little bit more complicated for those folks than it first appears. And just to, to wrap things up, if we just go through the panel, if each of you would say what you think would be the single most important policy that you would put in place <laughs> to help with some aspect of water quality, water mitigation, flood mitigation, what would that one policy be? You start that. Yeah, start <laughs> no, 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 no. I was gonna say, you should you should have given us this question beforehand, <laughs> so we had a chance to think about it. This is more fun. Nathan, uh, can I defer so I can give a little more thought? <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a ready answer. Come on. Okay, we'll start with yours. 
I can always jump in. Go ahead. I, I'm, not, I'm not shy. Um, you know, one thing I think that's really important is the Clean Water Act of 1972 was a great piece of legislation. But there are some sort of flaws around the edges. Um, you know, and it, it mainly deals with surface water. It doesn't really deal with groundwater. It deals with quality, not so much quantity. Um, I'm always really reluctant to open up something like that for tinkering because it could go horribly awry. Um, but I think there are pieces of that legislation that could be improved that would protect wetlands that have lost protection through court rulings. Um, so th to me, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a new piece of legislation that would have a big impact. I think we have some of the tools, if we could improve on them a little bit or, or use them more effectively. Um, and I think the Clean Water Act is, is really landmark and really is, has done some good things. And maybe it just needs to be sort of shined up and ready for the 2000s. I, I guess that's where I would start. I mean, I, I know what the issue is that I'd like to address, but I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure if it's a policy question or not. But Jerry brought it up in his talk over and over and over again. Somehow or another, we have to get a handle on non-point source pollution. I don't exactly know how to do that. There have been suggestions. For example, the tendency is to require centralized wastewater treatment systems like Iowa City's to remove more stuff. So right now, the, the Iowa City plant has to remove ammonia. So they have an ammonia discharge, for example. So if we felt like um, we needed to get the nitrate and other nitrogen form concentrations in the Iowa River down, you might come in and say, well, Iowa City, you have to remove more. But for Iowa City to remove more is going to be unbelievably expensive because they already removed some. So an example might be, well, maybe a lot of that nitrogen is coming from non-point sources. So an example might be the citizens of Iowa City might decide that instead of building this really expensive additional nitrogen removal system, what we'll do is we'll pay farmers in our watershed to take this 2% out of cropping and put a, a buffer strip or something in there that will prevent more nitrogen from getting in the water. And that, that might be overall cheaper way to do it. But some way to get a handle on non-point source pollution. Because if we don't do that, I don't think our water quality is going to improve much in Iowa. We can't do it very much. Additional with point sources, I don't think. <laughs> I'm going to cheat a little bit and kind of uh, piggyback uh, his answer. Um, in my opinion, any policy that promotes um, the best management practices that Jerry described in his talk, like buffer strips, um, no-till agriculture, contour plowing, um, terracing, and other things, have a dual benefit not only for water quality, um, but also for flooding, because it's a potential to hold water um, as it falls on the ground and keep it from getting in the stream so rapidly. Um, that gives the, the um, contaminants an opportunity to be mitigated uh, and also holds back water and attenuates floods. So I, th I think any policy that promotes those um, and the proliferation of those practices would be uh, a priority. Yeah, just yesterday I saw a farmer spraying a field, a uh, snowy field. That's before the legislature right now. I, I, I don't remember, Peter, if you asked the question uh, from a legislative standpoint, but, but from a rule or regulation, I guess I would like to see us adopt a nutrient quality criteria. Uh, not because I believe it would change anything too fast, but it might force us to come to grips with the non-point source problem that Gene mentioned and uh, maybe from a legal standpoint uh, back it up to uh, where uh, government and people and, and agricultural producers have to work together to figure out how to fix this thing. Can I just say one thing? Nutrient standards for lakes, uh, recreational standards, are out for public comment right now. Oh, okay. You have an opportunity to provide comment right now, and we're working on standards for, for streams and lakes, but the recreational nutrient standards is out for public comment, and, and again, it's your voice that's going to make a difference. So I invite you to, to go to those meetings or to have um, your say. May I add one other thing? Uh, um, my ecologist friends, I'm thinking of USGS and La Crosse and other people, Ken Lubinsky, would say that the key thing from a habitat ecosystem standpoint 
is for us to reconnect the river to its floodplain. So especially, and, and Nate, Nate pointed out that you don't always have the morphometry to, to do that well, but we have to start thinking about it's okay to have floods, you know, but we're going to live with floods and they're going to give us a lot of uh, benefits and we can't all just keep building higher and higher flood walls and levees and dikes. But that is what we're doing. <laughs>